Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of the history and geography of Tunisia. What you can see here is this little country. And after I do that, we're going to flip through this book and I'll show you some pictures of some people and places in Tunisia. So, Tunisia is located in northern Africa, in the western side of North Africa. It borders, um, let's see right here, Algeria and Libya, and has a long coast on the Mediterranean Sea. You can even see just in the corner here. <laughs> That's Sicily. Um, kind of important to its ancient history, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, Tunisia um, has some really interesting um, like climates and um, geographic areas, I suppose. Um, it has like three main sections. So this one up here is actually very lush and very good for growing crops. It has lots of farmlands around there, and that's mainly due to the Midjord River, which flows down from the Atlas Mountains right through here out into the Mediterranean. You can see that's where the capital city of Tunis is and lots of other major cities as well. The middle section here is very mountainous, very dry and rocky, but you know lots of interesting plant life as well. There's still lots of um, rivers and different places like that. And then when you get to this section down here, this is the start of the Sahara Desert. This region is called the Grand, I can't really see, Grand Eric Oriental, the span of desert. And here we have this big salt lake right here, the largest lake in Tunisia, which on the map here it's all dotted because it is a saltwater lake. It is called a shot, saltwater lake, shot. Quick note, um, I looked up a lot of references on Tunisia all over the internet and in books and things like that, and it's one of those places that is, like, everything in it is pronounced differently depending on your language. Like, I know, like, in Britain they say Tunisia instead of Tunisia. Um, I remember being, like, in my French class, like, my very first French class, and we had to learn a bunch of country names in French, and I remember um, Tunisie being on there and being like, that's random, but you'll find out why that was on the list. Um, so, I, if I mispronounce something, it's probably because I'm pronouncing it in a dialect from a different language, because I, I looked up a lot of sources. For example, um, in this city up here, I believe it's Bizerta. I'm not positive, but that's what I heard someone say it as, um, but, like, I don't know if that's, like, the English pronunciation, or it's not French, but I'm not sure, but that's how I heard it. And then this city down here, which will be important later in history, I believe it's Kairan, Kairan, something like that, um, but I'm not sure if, like, that's how it's pronounced in English, but that's what I'm going um, but the capital city, Tunis, right here, is where we get the name Tunisia. The country is named after the city. Also, interestingly, are the little islands off the coast here. Juba Island, I think, being the most interesting, being its largest island. There's actually a huge Jewish population on this island, and there is a very ancient synagogue on this island. Um, Tunisia is a really interesting country full of lots of ancient sites and um, different ancient landmarks. Uh, but what I think is really cool, because I'm a big movie buff, is that like three of some of my favorite movies were filmed in Tunisia. <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark was filmed here. The English Patient was filmed here. Probably like my favorite movie when I was in high school. It made me cry every time. Um, but my favorite movie series, Star Wars, was actually filmed in Tunisia. And if you see right here, this town's name is Tatooine, which is a planet in the Star Wars universe, a desert planet. And you can still see some um, sets that were built and left up. 
and you get to wear them and pretend that you're on a different planet. So, Tunisia's pretty interesting in that respect, I think. But let's go back and talk more about some of the ancient sites around Tunisia. Because during its ancient times, oh, oh gosh, I just looked, glanced at my notes. I missed one last important geographical thing. <laughs> Hold on, slow down. Um, Tunisia contains the northernmost point in Africa. And it's not labeled on this map, sadly, but it's just north here of Bizerta. Bizert? Bizert? It's called Cap Angela, and there's a little statue and everything there, recognizing it as the northernmost point of Africa. Okay, got that out of the way. So, ancient Tunisian history. This land, uh, before you know, any major cities or anything was built, was the home of the Berber tribes. They were a semi-nomadic people. I guess at first nomadic, but then later on semi-nomadic. Uh, that lived all throughout this area around the mountains. And um, still live there to this day. They, they haven't gone anywhere. Um, but the, the first people to come and settle and start building buildings, I suppose, were the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were an ancient civilization that lived in present-day Lebanon, and they were renowned sailors, and they would sail across the Mediterranean to present-day Spain, and so they needed, like, um, some stopovers places, so they set up cities around here in around the 12th century BCE, and then the city of Carthage was founded in the 9th century BCE, which you can see right here on the map, Carthage. Uh, Carthage was um, a semi-autonomous city. After a while, it gained tons of power, tons of influence. It was beautiful, all the, the ancient drawings of it, the huge seaport that it had here, the Gulf of Tunis, in what is modern day name. Um, it became a force to be reckoned with there influence spread throughout this area of Africa into Spain, and then they started conquering uh, the islands up here, which uh, the Roman Empire at the time was not very happy about, um, because they were kind of encroaching on their huge territory. So, um, there were three big wars between uh, Carthage and the Romans called the Punic Wars, Punic being the Roman word for Phoenicians. Um, the uh, first Punic War, you know, was over, um, you know, brushing up against their borders, what lands they were taking over. The second Punic War is the most important, <laughs> historically. Uh, it was sort of like a revenge war from the Carthaginians, and their leader, or the leader of the military attack was Hannibal Barca, which tomorrow's video is going to be a huge, long biography about Hannibal Park. So look forward to that. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. It's really good. You get to see my little toy elephant. Um, the Second Punic War happened during the 3rd century BCE. Hannibal took his army and his war elephants uh, throughout Europe because they didn't want to cross the ocean, because it, or the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, because it was ruled by the Roman Empire. So, um, yeah, he, he went famously went over the Alps into Italy, huge battles. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to spoil too much of the video tomorrow. Um, but I, I will say that, um, Hannibal and the Carthaginians wound up losing the second Punic War as well. Carthage was, uh, occupied, like owned sort of by Rome. Um, which the Third Punic War was rising up against them. Um, and in that case, the Romans came and swiftly defeated them, and they, you know, <laughs> destroyed Carthage. Um, all we see to today are just a couple of buildings because the Romans completely flattened the city to get these Carthaginians away from them. So the area wound up being conquered by the Roman Empire. And this region up here was nicknamed the breadbasket of Rome, or the granary of the empire. Um, it was really famous for its olive oil. It was like a huge olive oil producer. It still is today. Um, there were 
periods in its history when it wasn't, but the Romans were the one that introduced the olive oil industry up here to Tunisia. They also built the El Gem Amphitheater, which is the second largest Roman am amphitheater in the Roman Empire. Um, the first obviously being the Colosseum in Rome. Most of it's still standing today. It's absolutely gorgeous ruin, the El Gem Amphitheater. But of course, uh, the Roman Empire did not last. Um, it wound up under the control of the Western Roman Empire, which was still governed by Rome, which was crippled over time and dwarfed by the, uh, the strength of the Eastern Roman Empire over in Byzantium, or slash Constantinople, slash Istanbul, as it would come to be known. So, since Rome was falling apart at the seams, so was control of this area, and they wound up in, invaded by the Vandals, which was a Germanic tribe. They took over between the 5th and 6th century CE. Um, they, they wound up ransacking Rome as well. Um, so, the Byzantine Empire, or, you know, the, the Eastern Roman Empire, wound up coming in and reconquering the area um, sometime between 533-534. Uh, but the damage was done. The, the Vandals, like, you know, wiped out uh, most of the, the resources in the area. The Berber people were not pleased. So um, when the Arabs came with their new religion, Islam, um, they were very welcomed by the Berbers at first. So um, the Arabs took over the area in the 7th century. They established the city of Cairon, made it the capital. They renamed the land to Ifriq, which is where we get the name Africa today. Um, they obviously brought Islam in. Cairon today is the world's oldest standing minaret. Really interesting. And um, after a while, they really started to clash with some of the Berber tribes because some were not so enthusiastic about Islam as the others. And over time... Um, Ifriqiya, this region up here, would be ruled by five great Arab dynasties that would be the, again, if I mispronounce these, do let me know if you're Tunisian or living in Tunisia or anything. If I mispronounce something, please, please, please correct me in the comments. I greatly welcome corrections. Um, the Aglipi dynasty was between 800 and 909. Um, the Fatimid dynasty, um, well, I didn't write down on my notes when they reigned, but, um, the main conflict between those dynasties was the whole division between Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims, so, um, the dynasties kind of interchanged until the Fatimids handed control over to the Berber tribes, so the Zirid dynasty began 1044 to 1148, I wrote that one down, um, so a Berber-controlled Islamic-ran dynasty. They were later invaded by the Almohads, which was another Berber Muslim uh, tribe that took over from 1160 to 1207. And then it would be the Hafsids from 1207 to 1574. And that was the one that really picked up the area by its bootstraps. Um, reformed it. They moved the capital to Tunis, renamed the area Tunisia, um, and lots of prosperity, lots of um, education, knowledge, things like that. Um, you know, the, the farming picked back up, all those wonderful things. Um, their only main downfall is that they allied with Spain, and um, Spain and the Ottoman Empire went to war, and the Ottomans defeated Spain, so the Ottomans wound up conquering the um, territories that were allied with Spain. Thanks to pirates. If you've ever heard of Redbeard the pirate, um, he uh, allied himself with the Ottomans and went through and conquered Algiers and then later Tunis. So the Ottomans officially took over in 1574, um, but the Ottoman Empire very famously also wound up collapsing toward its end times. Tunisia became more of an autonomous ruled country, sort of separate from the Ottomans. Um, they established rulers called Beys, and it was the beginning of the Husaynid dynasty, uh, which pretty 
pretty much controlled Tunisia from 1705 to 1957. And, um, you know, the Bays were very powerful people, um, but during that reign, um, trade uh, really declined. Um, there were some bouts of plague, um, and, and basically they just ran out of money. They, their debt was too large, and they declared bankruptcy. Meanwhile, during this time in the 1800s, the French had been kind of snooping in and setting up businesses in the area. And um, in 1881, France was like, oh, this area is bankrupt. Well, I heard that they're invading Algeria, so we're going to intervene with our military and invade with thousands of troops to stop the invasion of Algeria, which... From what I've looked up, there's at, like no proof that that ever happened. It was literally just an excuse to invade the country and take over, which they did. So by 1881, Tunisia became a French protectorate. Um, they set up French as the official language. They still let the Bays rule um, as sort of like a puppet government. They didn't have any real power. France had all the power. Um, but they really focused on modernization. And, you know, the Tunisian economy perked up in that sense. Uh, but they were still very under the thumb of France, which any time there was any kind of riot or um, demonstration against France, they were squashed. Um, not very kindly, let's just say. Because <laughs> this is an ASMR channel, and we talk about some tough things on this channel, but I do it in the most relaxing way possible. For example, in 1942, the Nazis invaded Tunisia because uh, the Nazis occupied France. Therefore, they wound up into Tunisia, where, if you remember, there was a large Jewish population at the time. So that was not a good thing to happen to the population there. <laughs> I say it in a nice, calm way. Um, but there were battles for the territory between the Allies and Axis powers, and the Allies surrendered the territory of May 13th, 1943. So once World War II was over and Tunisia was back under French rule, they were like, so do we get independence now? Because that's what we really want. And, um, you know, we, we helped you guys out during the war and France was just like, nah, nah, that's fine. We can still control you. So there were a lot more demonstrations, a lot more protests, mainly led by a man named Habib Bourguiba. Eventually, um, France gave in, and Tunisia won its independence on March 20th, 1956. After it became a republic, Habib Regiba became president, and um, he was a very, um, like, radical-thinking person in terms of Islamic rule. He made divorce legal, he made abortion legal, he outlawed polygamy. Um, and he gave a lot more rights to women than most Arab countries had at the time. Um, even letting them hold positions of political power, things like that. He was very forward-thinking in that sense, which, you know, anchored a lot of the extreme Islamists. Who, you know, like, polygamy was part of their religion, you know, when he just straight up outlawed it. So they didn't think it was very kind. Um, there was a lot of opposition to his rule. Um, they rewrote the constitution so that uh, Bourguiba was president for life. Um, which, you know, as he got older, there were claims that he was acting very, like, paranoid. And in November 1987, his doctors said he was unfit to rule. And this prime minister took over as president. His name is Zin El Abidine Ben Ali. And he held tight control over Tunisia. Um, there were lots of elections that he won with, like, 95% of the vote, which is very unlikely to actually happen, so there were many allegations of election fraud throughout his entire reign. Um, he blew the financial budget on, you know, lavish lifestyle. Um, there were many allegations of corruption, and, um, you know, the economy started to tank over time. And this culminated on December 17th, 2010, when a street vendor named Mohammed Bouazizi self-immolated himself, um, which 
he's a kind way of saying, as a form of protest, he set himself on fire in the middle of the street, ended his life, um, which sparked massive outrage and protests. Um, he had done that because he could no longer afford to take care of his family with his, um, with the money he was making, selling things out on the streets. So, um, you know, it was a sign that something needed to be done. And after many, many huge, massive demonstrations and protests, um, Ben Ali resigned and he and his wife fled the country. Um, this movement um, led to the Arab Spring movement that um, encouraged many other Arab countries to also rise up against their governments, which to um, some extent was a success in some countries. In other countries, it was very much not, which we'll get into later when we go over the history of some of the countries affected by the Arab Spring. Um, but Tunisia had elections later that year in 2011. They were declared as fair, and democracy is returned to Tunisia. Um, politically, everything over there is very stable, as stable as democracies are during this really unprecedented time in world history. Uh, but obviously much better than, you know, a, a man who had taken control for almost 30 years. Um, the only um, major news that came out of Tunisia since then were the terror attacks that happened in 2015 after the uh, Charlie Hebdo incident in France. Uh, the Bardo Museum was attacked, which is a really gorgeous museum in Tunis. Um, it's a museum that has collected a lot of the Carthaginian and Roman art and mosaics and many things that would have, you know, if left out in the sun and the sand would have weathered and been lost over time, like many um, other places in this area have. So the Bardo Museum um, stores all of them in really beautiful rooms, and, you know, you can walk through each room and see all the different gorgeous mosaics and relics. Uh, but very sadly, it was a place of tragedy in 2015. But um, Tunisia is definitely a forward-moving country and is, you know, on the up and up in terms of human rights, things like that. So that is my brief history of Tunisia. I know it was very brief. I could have gone into a lot more details, especially during the Arab rule. I wrote down a lot of notes for that and then realized that oh, I don't want this to be like a two-hour video. <laughs> I find really like little aspects of history interesting that other people probably find really boring or repetitive. There's a random person outside, but whatever. I live in a big city. Let's flip through this book and I'll show you some pictures of Tunisia. Carefully set down this pencil. Tunisia. It's a Berber child. This little sheepy old man. And here's a good example of the, um, like, terrain. Like, that's a village down there. You can see all the, the gorgeous mountain scenery up there. Really beautiful area. And then here is the Gulf of Tunis from above. More of the desert area. This is the Atlas Mountains. This is the Chot El Cherid, the salt lake that I showed you on the map. It's this one right here. There's a falcon. It's very intense. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? It's an oasis in the desert. And here is a fennec fox, which is probably my favorite form of fox. This is the... Um, Habib Bourguiba Avenue in Tunis, uh, which has apparently been renamed. This book is from 2009, so Ben Ali was still in power when this book came out. <laughs> it phrases his reign very delicately. Um, so I'm not sure if they've changed the name back to the Habib Bourguiba Avenue. I don't know. I should have looked that up. This is, um, so again, the pronunciation um, I heard it pronounced as Susa, 
but the, the francophone in me wants to say sus and keep that E silent. I'm not sure which one it is. If you know, let me know. But really gorgeous seaside town. Let me show you on the map here. Sus is, or Sus is right here. And um, this is Kairan. Kairan. So I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I've been trying. And down here it says that the name may have created the word caravan. Here are some ruins of Carthage. And here are some artifacts from the Bardo Museum. So you can see what I'm talking about, like these gorgeous big rooms. And you can see all of the ancient art inside. It's so pretty inside this museum. More, um... This, was, this looks Roman, but... Let's see what it says. The temples of Minerva. Yeah, definitely Roman. And some Phoenician gravestones, which, um, if the word Phoenician sounds familiar, it's where we get the word phonetic, as in the phonetic alphabet or phonics. Our modern alphabet in English derives from the Phoenician alphabet. Here is Hannibal and his elephants going over the mountains. Again, check that out later. This is the El Gem Coliseum. So gorgeous. Um, this is obviously the side that hasn't been destroyed. Um, like over time and during battles, part of it was destroyed, but most of it's still intact. Um, graves of Christian martyrs in Carthage. So, um, yeah, a lot of Christians that lived in the area uh, fled or were killed when... Um, you know, different people took control. This is, let's see. Oh, this is the Great Mosque of Kairan. Isn't that gorgeous? And here is um, Khalif Harani Rashid, who was made famous by the book The Arabian Nights. Um, he was a caliph during the Abbasid period. The towering outer walls of the monastery Rabat, which the Aglubids began work on in the 9th century. Monastery is also right here along the ocean. Monastery. And let's see this picture. This is, um, oh, I didn't mention all of the different invasions of the territory, but there were moments where Europeans returned and reconquered the area for like very brief periods of time, so I didn't really mention it. This is uh, when King Louis invaded for a very brief amount of time before the Ottomans took over. King Louis of France, I should say. These are the Janissaries, um, which is how I've always pronounced that word, but I'm not sure if that's correct, but that's how I've always said it in my old history class. Um, they were the um, military fighters of the Ottoman Empire. Let's see, who's this? This is Bey Murad. He won a struggle, political struggle in 1631, started the hereditary line of Bey Pasha, title he adopted. This is a naval base in the early years of the French protectorate. Love old photographs of places. It's so, so neat. I think. Here is a protest in the 1950s. Um, you know, protesting independence, protesting their right for independence. This is Habib Bourguiba. Let's see, there's a guy voting. And this is Ben Ali, who is no longer in charge of the government, but when this book came out, he was still the ruler. So this section might be a little inaccurate. Let's see, a parliamentary session. My cat's very loudly snoring over there. An armed policeman. And this is the Borgiba family mausoleum and monastery. Very gorgeous, isn't it? So here's an example of um, Berber women and their really gorgeous clothing and headscarves and everything. It looks like what it says they're doing. They're harvesting crops near Maktar in Tunisia. 
And look at the Sahara Desert. God, it's so... <laughs> it's so desolate, but so beautiful at the same time. This is in Sfax, which is... Let me show you on the map. It's right here on the coast. And there's some fishermen. The phosphate plants. Um, that's um, their, one of their main mining industries there in Tunisia. And some gorgeous carpets. Oh, look at this building. The Grand Hotel de Lac in Tunisia. Looks like it's upside down. Here we see um, the town view of Madia in Tunisia, which features the modern port, roads, and efficient transportation system. Awesome. Oh, let's see. This is uh, Kirkwan and oh, that's one of those places that I I heard like three different pronunciations for this territory, so I'm not even gonna bother. Someone let me know in the comments. So oh, this is the chapter about the environment, so it's like smoke in the air. Oh, wow. Gotta fix that. An example of erosion in the desert. Desertification is an issue in um, pretty much any country that the Sahara touches, so it's being combated against in Tunisia. Here's a page about um, the water wells. These different wells have been put into the villages to make sure that everyone has clean drinking water. Uh, what a typical Tunisian street looks like. Oh, look at this guy. This is the, let's see, a Dax antelope. How beautiful that is. Oh, and so here's a good example. This is in Duga. Um, a good example of what the northern lush green territory I was telling you about looks like. Like, would you believe that this land is near the Sahara Desert? Like, it's gorgeous. Look how gorgeous. <laughs> so cute. These books always have cute kids in them. <laughs> cute. Oh. Let's see. It says Tunisia has a very young overall population. Modern Tunisian sitting in a cafe in the city. Here are some Berbers. Their supplies there. This page is like an example of what skin color typically looks like, but from what I've seen, it's very um, diverse skin types. There's not like one main one. This is a rabbi on um, Jerba Island at the Griba Synagogue. And here's, it says, an engraver in the Medina, part of a growing number of lower and middle class skilled workers. The Medina is um, a word for like the center, like the old town of the city. Sense. Some nomadic groups with all their belongings and their very cute coats. Let's see, some gorgeous headdresses there. Isn't that beautiful? Let's see. Family traveling by donkey, says the caption. Probably wondering why the photographer is taking their picture. An example of government public housing. And then an example of um, what is actually the like upper class homes in Tunisia. They're very plain on the outside, and then when you go inside, it's like gorgeous rooms and tiles and room after room. Beautiful. And then here's an example of a troglodyte home, which is like an underground house. Dug about six feet into the earth because long ago the people found it was easier to dig through the soft rock than to make bricks out of it. Students studying very hard. And a policewoman directing traffic, it says. The modern women of Tunisia, says the caption, are very different from their rural counterparts, being much more proactive in the fight for their rights. Little girls dressed in their traditional outfits. Through their lives, they'll go through different rites of passage. Isn't that gorgeous? I love these headdresses. 
And then these books always contain examples of what weddings, like wedding attire looks like. This is a westernized wedding, isn't it? Oh, gorgeous. And some sales staff at Silver. How beautiful. Mosque in Monastir. Gorgeous. Look at all this intricate work in the walls. That's so pretty. Um, another example throughout the town. Oh, wow. Mosque in the desert. Let's read this caption. It says five times. Oh, it's just about Islam. <laughs> I was hoping it'd be more about Tunisia, not the religion, but isn't that a gorgeous picture? Oh, that's so cool. Look at that little mosque. Out in, it's like the middle of nowhere. Here's another one. So neat, isn't it? It says, a shrine for a local saint and a Berber pit home. Oh, that's a house right there. In an otherwise deserted landscape. Then on about some history. We'll keep going. This is the Hand of Fatima, which um, I've seen a lot. It's called different things in different cultures, but that's what it's called um, in Islamic culture. I feel like it's becoming more of a fashion statement lately. I feel like I'm seeing it everywhere. The Cathedral of St. Vincent de Paul in Tunisia, built in 1883. It's a really pretty building, too. An example of what street signs would look like. Um, you'll see a lot of signs in Arabic, which is the official language of Tunisia. Um, and then a lot of signs are also in English and French as well. And, let's see, oh, this is an example of some ancient books, it says, Tunisian ladies engaging in conversation, says the caption. An example of, um, you can see Arabic and French. Oh, isn't that beautiful? The art section, look at these. These are beautiful. And, um, a mosaic from Duga in the Bardo Museum. This is Ulysses. Here is a Byzantine fortress. <laughs> Gotta position this better. There we go. Oh, here's a good example of what the interior of those gorgeous houses look like. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at all the little details. All the woodwork. It's so pretty. On Jerp Island, the potter turns the wheel, the shop. And this is um, carpets being sold. This is a pretty one. I like that one. Ooh, so this is a really gorgeous page of the Quran. All beautifully drawn, gorgeous calligraphy. That's so pretty. It's an old guy reading a book. And some guys playing dominoes. It's one of my favorite games. I love dominoes. Oops. Sorry, book. You okay there? It's okay. Okay. Sailing dinghies at Hamamet. For water sports, it gained a lot of popularity. And then, of course, football slash soccer is huge in Tunisia. Like it is in almost every country in the world. Here's a gorgeous golf course. Oh, so, um, here's a picture of some horseback stunts, and let's see if I can find the notes. Is it on this page? Let's see. I don't think it's on this page, but I will tell you about it. Here's some more shopping out on the souk. Here we go. It's on this page, the festivals page I want to talk about. There'll be a picture in there I want to show you. So that's a street festival. Here it is. This is the picture I wanted to show you. So this is the um, big festival in Duz, where there are lots of cool like horse races, camel races, sand hockey, um, dog racing. Um, just like a huge, huge event out in the desert with like all these bright colors and everything. It's so neat. I've seen lots of videos from it. It's so cool. Uh, ooh, some food. Let's get the page. Yeah, food. Look at these spices. Yum, yum. 
let's see, this is, let's see, oh, lamb and lemon tahini on couscous. Oh, that sounds really good. It says the national drink is mint tea, sometimes served with pine kernels and always with lots of sugar and no milk. It's like the opposite of how I take my tea. Some mixed salad, and these look good. These are Tunisian meatballs. Yum. What's in a Tunisian meatball? Breadcrumbs, of course, parsley, nutmeg, and lots of spices. Saffron, cinnamon, pepper. Mmm. Sounds great. A nice little detailed map of Tunisia. And that little dot is where it's located in the world. Right up there in Africa. So that's pretty much it for my video, I should say. If there's anything else I need to show you. Festival of Sahara down here. I was just telling you about the Chot. There's Duca. I didn't show you on the map, but I don't think it's listed on the map, so that's where it is. <laughs> Along the river there. Carthage. Sparta Museum. And that's pretty much it. So I'm going to let you go from there. So that was all about Tunisia. Tomorrow I'll have a video about Hannibal Barca. It's, I've already filmed it. It's, it's really fun, I think. Really interesting. You'll definitely learn some things. So be sure to check that out tomorrow. And that's all I've got for you tonight. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational. I hope you learned something really cool. Let me know what it was in the comments if you're still awake. And I hope you have a very good, good day.